I'm Severin Bornstein. I'm a professor here at the Haas School of Business. I'm also the faculty director of the Energy Institute at Haas. Um, I'm on the Board of Governors of the California Independent System Operator, which runs the grid in California. And I also sit on the Advisory Council to the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, which is responsible for air pollution and air pollution regulation in the Bay Area. So what I'm going to do today is talk about a number of questions that I've been asked as the uh, COVID-19 pandemic has taken over our thinking about everything, including energy markets. Um, most of the questions and most of the impact has been in the oil market, so I'm going to focus primarily there, but I'll also talk about natural gas and electricity markets as well. Uh, we're going to talk briefly about um, why oil prices have fallen so drastically um, and uh, and what the impact of that is, uh, what that means for consumers, what it means for producers in this market, and a big question that people keep asking, what that means for workers and jobs. I also will touch on the longer run outlook for the oil market and the question I've been asked, why are we in a permanently low oil price world? Is this here to stay? Uh, and then lastly, I'll switch over and talk a bit about the electricity industry and what the pandemic is doing to the electricity industry uh, and the mix of production and the move to renewable energy sources. So oil prices have fallen drastically, as probably everyone knows. Uh, if we go back to the middle of January three months ago, uh, they were around $60 a barrel. This is the US price of oil for what's called West Texas Intermediate. The world price is, as I'll talk about later, isn't quite the same thing and is actually a bit higher than the US price these days. But uh, the US price has fallen from 60 to about $18 a barrel on, in its close on Friday, April 17th. So why has that happened? Uh, well, of course, we're gonna talk about supply and demand. I'm an economist and uh, that's, uh, how I, the lens through which I see this market, and it's a pretty useful lens. Uh, you probably remember supply and demand graphs from your economics class, uh, that uh, the demand goes down as the price goes up, and as the price falls, the demand expands. The supply is determined also by price, as if for a higher price, uh, the suppliers in the market are willing to create, to produce more oil and put it out in the market. And this is the basic paradigm, but you need to adjust it a bit when you're thinking about the oil market. This is a better representation of what the oil market actually looks like. Uh, first of all, notice that it isn't a straight line, but actually more hockey stick shaped. There's a lot of cheap oil in the world. There's a lot of oil that can pro be produced at very, very low cost, generally less than $20 a barrel, much of it less than $10 a barrel. But as you start getting near the world oil demand uh, levels, you start getting into more expensive oil. The cheap oil is mostly in the Middle East and a number of other locations. Very little of it is in the United States or in North America generally. Uh, the North American oil actually to be economic to produce requires a substantially higher price. Uh, these days, uh, most analysts think that at anything below $40 a barrel, there isn't much point in drilling for new oil in North America. Uh, and it takes a price above that to really have an active uh, US and Canadian oil market. Uh, you've probably heard that in recent years, US production has expanded quite a bit. And the US is actually the largest oil producer in the world as of January. Uh, although not the largest exporter because Saudi Arabia is almost as large a producer and it exports a much, much higher share of what it produces. Uh, the US has started to produce a lot more oil primarily by using the technology of hydraulic fracturing or fracking. And fracking, although it's a very effective technology, is not a cheap technology. So 
the cost of fracking oil and producing oil through fracking in the United States is probably closer to 40 or $50 a barrel, whereas the cost of pulling oil out from the Saudi Arabian oil wells is probably closer to 10 or $15 a barrel. So that's one aspect of it. We, we actually have a very uh, nonlinear supply curve. And one effect of that is if you look at what the, the intersection that's determining price, if demand suddenly shifts up or down, you get very big swings in price because the supply curve is so vertical, so inelastic. Uh, and we saw this in the past actually with increases in demand um, or slight changes in supply that uh, when, if we had a restriction of supply, say by one country uh, that's uh, producing, uh, having some political turmoil that reduces their production, whether it's Iraq or Libya, uh, we've seen prices go up quite a bit as a result. Or back in the strong economies of 2004, 5, 6, we saw very high prices well, where demand was growing and some of the oil producers were having political turmoil. What we're seeing right now is just the reverse. Demand has suddenly shrunk quite a bit. Uh, the estimates of world oil demand are a bit all over the map, but it's likely that the world oil demand is 25 to 35% lower than would have been anticipated for this time of year. Uh, and so that is a huge shift. We've never seen a sudden demand change like that in the oil market since we've had organized oil markets for the last 50 or 70 years. Um, and so when that demand has shifted in, naturally we'd expect to see a pretty extreme fall in price. But actually there's a reason that the price fall has been a bit more extreme than that. Uh, and that is that Saudi Arabia uh, is the leader of the oil, world oil cartel known as OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. And prior to the pandemic, Saudi Arabia had been reasonably effective recently at getting, at restricting the output of oil, not just from its own country, but from the other members of OPEC and what is known as OPEC plus, including Russia and Mexico and a few other countries. So um, we, what we've seen two things happen. One, that demand has shifted and, in, and the other is this cartel has become much less effective. Now, you may have heard in the news a lot of talk about how Saudi Arabia uh, and Russia are trying to put the cartel back together and how the meltdown of the cartel is the major problem. It's not. Um, the big problem is the, is the decrease in demand. Even if there were no oil cartel at all, uh, we would have seen a huge drop in oil prices right now uh, with this huge shift in demand. To put, give you some context, in the 100 million barrel a day market for crude oil, uh, the loss of de the decrease in demand is probably around 30 million barrels a day. The increase in supply from this more aggressive competition between Saudi Arabia and Russia is at most 3 million barrels a day. So most of what's going on here is just this collapse in demand is causing a huge shift in the uh, price in the market. The, the competition between Saudi Arabia and Russia, that is the meltdown of the cartel, is playing some role. But once you get demand way down here in this area, cartels are not going to have much effect one at all because the amount of oil they would have to take off the market in order to start getting prices back up to this range is almost the entire output of OPEC. So they aren't going to be able to restrict output that much. Uh, so you'd expect this cartel to be pretty ineffective at this level. And that's because demand has shifted in so much. Uh, and as I said, demand has shifted in quite a bit, uh, probably down about 30%. We've seen this in U.S. figures, which are a bit more reliable. Uh, U.S. gasoline uh, supplies have, redu have gone down 48% in the last month alone. Jet fuel demand is down almost three quarters, almost 75%. And even diesel demand is down. Diesel demand has not fallen quite as much because while we are seeing a big reduction in personal vehicle driving, we're seeing a much smaller reduction in trucking uh, still significant, but not as big um, because we're still seeing goods going to stores, uh, many stores at least, and we're still seeing a lot of delivery to homes. 
So the demand for diesel, which usually actually fluctuates more than gasoline with the movements in the macro economy, this time is actually fluctuating less uh, and has not dropped as much. Uh, as you may have heard, the current admis administration in the US is trying to bolster the OPEC cart cartel uh, and get them to raise prices, what they call price stabilization, but what economists would call uh, simply trying to create a cartel um, or bolster the cartel. And uh, that has not been successful. Uh, the prices that we saw on, the, on Friday uh, on the April 17th are as low as we have seen in the last two decades. Uh, and I don't think it's likely to be successful, though the U.S. does have a lot of different levers to pull uh, to get some of these oil producing countries that have political reliance on the United States to uh, cooperate. Uh, we'll talk in a few minutes about what that would mean if they actually did manage to get the price to rise somewhat. Um, uh, but I think that it's pretty clear it's going to be a really tough thing for even the U.S. to pull off. And uh, it's probably, as I'll talk about, not really in the interest of the U.S. as a whole anyway. Uh, this is not to say that, as we've heard in some quarters, uh, we're just going to run out of places to put oil. Right now, what's happening is more oil is being produced than is being consumed. And that means it's going into storage. There's a lot of storage facilities in the world, and they're starting to fill up. Uh, and at some point, if we continue on this path, they, they will fill up, and we will run out of space to store the oil. Uh, as we get close to that, what's going to happen is prices are going to really plunge, uh, even more than they have. And we've actually seen this already um, in the United States and, and parts of Canada because uh, the world oil market is not perfectly integrated. The US price is lower than the Brent crude world price, in part because it's tough to get oil, or can be difficult to get oil from the oil producing areas of the US, uh, West Texas, Oklahoma, North Dakota, and so forth, to the ports where they could be shipped elsewhere or could just compete with imports of oil to feed the refineries that are on, for instance, the Texas Gulf Coast. Uh, we, what's, what we've seen already is that the price of oil for those locations in the United States where oil is produced has fallen even further. In fact, there have been reports in some parts of Texas of oil prices falling to three or five dollars a barrel. That's because there just isn't the capacity to move that oil, that all that extra oil that there isn't any demand for in the middle part of the country uh, to move it to other locations. So we've seen a, uh, the pipelines that typically carry oil out of those areas uh, hit their capacity and that causes the price on the producing end to fall. As a result, we've seen much bigger spreads between US prices of oil and the world price than we have seen in the last, the last time we saw this was back in 2011 when we had a similar phenomenon of more oil in the middle of the country than you can get out to the uh, rest of the world. Uh, we are seeing this happen in the Permian Basin in West Texas. We're seeing it happen in North Dakota. And we're also seeing it happen up in Canada uh, in the tar sands oil production area where prices have fallen very drastically. So we're not really able to get all that oil to market that is being produced. Um, they're storing it there, but what we're also starting to see is uh, sudden reductions in production. And oil producers hate doing this. Uh, they, when you have a well that's producing, first of all, it's actually costly to shut it down. Um, and secondly, it actually damages the well and generally means that in, even in the long run, you won't be able to get as much oil out of it. So once you drill a well, you'd really like to keep producing. What's interesting is the costs of drilling a well and producing are very different. So this $40 or $50 a barrel number I quoted before for producing oil in the US includes the cost of drilling. Once you've drilled the well, the cost of actually producing from it is substantially lower, is probably in the $20 range. Uh, so at least until we saw prices fall even further in the last week, uh, it was likely that those wells would continue to produce 
as long as prices were in the $25 or $30 range. But now that we've seen prices drop even below 20, uh, I'm sure these producers are starting to think about whether they have to shut down these wells uh, in the middle of production, the ones they've already drilled. And of course, we're not likely to see much new drilling with prices that low. So why haven't we seen this happen with natural gas prices? And this is a picture of natural gas, a figure of the price of natural gas prices over the same time period. And what you'll see is they've gone down a little bit uh, from the dollar 90 per, this, these are in million British thermal units, the standard measure, um, to uh, closer to a dollar 60 or dollar 70, but they're pretty modest declines. And the biggest reason is that if you go back to this graph, this isn't what the supply of natural gas looks like. It's actually much more just looks like this first part where we have a pretty gradual slope to the supply curve. There's plenty of gas these days uh, in North America and you don't have as much trade across uh, continents. And so when the demand goes down, which it has for natural gas to some extent, you don't see as big a, a shift in price. The other thing is demand just hasn't fallen as much for natural gas. The biggest effect, because people are quarantined and aren't allowed to move around, has been in transportation fuels and transportation and natural gas is by and large used for heating, uh, uh, both water and air, and for cooking and for industrial processes. Uh, those have not slowed down nearly as much, although there has been some decline in demand. So what has this done to consumers? Well, the first thing we have to recognize is the pass through uh, to retail prices has been slow. And that's always been true in uh, gasoline and diesel markets, uh, but we have seen it. Uh, and in fact, gasoline prices in the United States and particularly in California have uh, fallen uh, commensurately with the price of oil. For every $10 per barrel drop in the price of oil, typically we expect to see about uh, two and a half cents per gallon drop in the price of gasoline. We've actually seen that happen in gasoline prices. Gasoline prices in California uh, have dropped uh, as well. What's interesting is if you are familiar with my work, I've done a lot of study of California gasoline prices because they are higher than the rest of the country by more than you can just justify by uh, higher taxes and the environmental fees we have. Uh, this started in 2015 and it's a bit of a mystery. In fact, I refer to it as the mystery gasoline surcharge. Uh, for those of you who have followed that, the mystery gasoline surcharge unfortunately is alive and well. While we have seen our prices fall, uh, they have not fallen enough to get rid of the mystery gasoline surcharge. That is still uh, part of what we're paying in California. So California prices remain about a dollar a gallon above the US average uh, when they should be closer to about 70 or a little less than 70 cents a gallon higher than the US average based on our higher taxes and cost of producing the cleaner blend ga gasoline California produces or uses and uh, the various environmental programs. Some people say, well, yeah, the price of gasoline is down, but that doesn't really help consumers because uh, they're not driving anywhere. And as the figure I quoted you before shows, that's not really true. Uh, California, our uh, US consumers are consuming less, but they're down about 50%, a little less. Uh, that means they're still using half as much gasoline. And when the price of gasoline falls, uh, that is a pure win for consumers. They are saving on every gallon of gasoline. Uh, and so consumers definitely are benefiting from this, not as much as they will uh, if prices stay this low and when they start moving around more. The effect on producers is a little more complicated. Uh, first of all, we have to distinguish between US producers and uh, lower cost producers such as Saudi Arabia and other OPEC members. And secondly, we have to distinguish between new wells, as I mentioned earlier, and existing wells. So uh, Saudi Arabia uh, is a low cost producer. The US is a much higher cost producer. And so when uh, Saudi Arabia produces their oil, uh, they make uh, 
something, they, it costs them five or $10 a barrel and they get the market price for it. US producers also get the market price. Actually, they get a little less because of this problem of moving oil out of the, uh, the center of the country where most of it's produced. Um, but, uh, but the problem is they have a much higher cost of production. So if they're producing oil at say $40 a barrel, and they are, uh, and they and they are selling at, let's say, at the same world price as Saudi Arabia, and let's say that's fifty dollars a barrel. Uh, they're making about ten dollars a barrel, whereas the Saudis, producing it at say five dollars a barrel, are making forty-five dollars per barrel. So they're making a lot more money. Consumers are getting the benefits of this much lower uh, oil price. But actually, most of the cost of that is being borne by producers elsewhere, uh, because they're the ones who are making the big profits off of the higher prices. And so they're the ones losing the most off of these lower prices. Now, production is going down in the United States, but that's because uh, we're not producing as much oil. There is this distinction, as I mentioned before, between new wells and existing wells uh, in the U US. Uh, if prices were to stay above $20 a barrel, which they probably will be in that range pretty soon, as I'll talk about in a minute, um, then most of the existing wells would be uh, continue to produce. Uh, but new wells would not be drilled. And that has an important implication for uh, jobs. Uh, people have been talking about trying to save the industry and this attempt at uh, bolstering the OPEC cartel to get prices up has been uh, argued, the people who have argued for that, including some politicians in Texas, have said we need to do that in order to save jobs. But that's really a bit misguided, and here's why. Um, the, as I said, if the price were to get back up to the $30, $35 range, which is probably the very best they could hope for, it's even that seems unlikely in the next few months, uh, you would continue to produce from existing wells, but you certainly wouldn't be drilling many new wells at that price. But if you look at where the jobs are in the oil industry, they're mostly in exploration and drilling. Once you've actually drilled the well, there are far fewer jobs in operating it and pumping oil out. So continuing to uh, produce from existing wells, which is what the main effect of getting the price up to the 30 or $35 range would be, actually mostly benefits the owners and shareholders of the oil companies, not the workers, because that's not going to save many jobs. If we could get the price of oil, or if the price of oil, whether the US did it or not, were to rise back to the 50 or $60 range, that would save some jobs. The oil industry does employ a couple hundred thousand people. But most of the benefits of that higher price would be flowing to other producers in other lower cost producing countries because they are the ones making the big profits of those prices. Um, whereas uh, so the jobs in the oil industry in the US are a relatively small share of the extra cost that we would be paying as consumers. So getting the oil price up does benefit the oil industry uh, getting it up a little bit benefits mostly shareholders. Moving it all the way back up to where it was before uh, the pandemic, which doesn't sound like it's going to happen anytime soon, would also preserve some jobs in the oil industry. But the cost per job preserved um, to consumers in the U.S. would be enormous. And uh, that's a consideration that seems to be getting lost in the current discussions. Our oil prices high oil prices here to, or low oil prices here to stay. Uh, this is the futures curve. Uh, that is the price of oil for delivery in future months. And uh, this actually starts for June uh, uh, 2020. Uh, there is an earlier contract that's still being traded for May 2020, although it will end trading in the next uh, few days actually before it will end trading before the alumni reunion. Um, but that price is the one I quoted you earlier for $18. Uh, as you can see, the price is expected to rise very 
sharply in the next few months. This is what in futures markets is known as contango, when the futures prices are much higher uh, than the spot price or the very uh, near delivery price. And what we can see is the current price is around $18. Even the June delivery is slightly over 25. And going out to towards the end of the year, it's, uh, oh, it's over $30 a barrel. Uh, that is uh, the direct result of the fact that we're running out of storage space and it is very difficult to shut down these wells, or very costly to shut down wells quickly. And so we have a lot more oil coming out, pouring onto the market right now uh, with fewer and fewer places to put it. Uh, so there's a real discount on producing oil right now relative to even producing it six months from now. Uh, and uh, so this idea that we're in a permanent uh, sub $20 a barrel market uh, is pretty unlikely. now. All of these things, of course, have to be caveated. We don't know what's going to happen with the virus and uh, treatments, but um, in, unless we really are in a prolonged, prolonged uh, depression, I think oil prices are almost certainly going to rebound over the next year. Uh, this also has another interesting implication, which is for the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. One of the places where the current administration probably is, uh, has a good idea is they have suggested filling the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. And that's probably a good idea simply because this contango, this uh, excess supply right now with an anticipated higher price later, implies that putting oil into inventory now has a huge return to it. If you could buy at 18 and sell six months from now at, or a year from now at double the price, uh, that would be an amazing return. The US has, I'm not sure what the exact number is, but hundreds of millions of barrels of capacity. It could buy a lot of oil now. That would push up the price of oil today and it would pull down the price of oil for future delivery a little bit. Uh, but uh, it would be a way for the US government to make money, for them to, in some ways, help out US oil producers by using this as a place to store their oil when there's too much oil coming on the market right now. Uh, so filling the Strategic Petroleum Reserve right now probably makes sense. You got to move fast, though. That's one of the things this curve is telling us. If you start thinking about this now and implement it six months from now, you've already missed the boat. So if the US could move very fast and start filling the SPR now, that would make a lot of sense. There's a larger lesson, though, coming out of this that I also want to point out. And that is that this crash in oil prices that we've seen now happened in part because of the sudden drop in demand. But a lot of this would happen, going back to that supply curve I showed you, uh, even if we very gradually reduce demand. And if we're going to really attack climate change and we're really going to make changes in greenhouse gas emissions, we're going to have to burn a lot less oil. Unfortunately, this is a reminder that if we burn a lot less oil, we almost certainly are going to see a crash in the price of oil. When the price of oil comes down to $20 a barrel, gasoline is can easily be around a dollar a gallon and that makes the economics of electric vehicles a lot tougher. Uh, so this is one of the big challenges. Uh, driving oil out of the world energy market is going to be really tough because there's so much cheap oil in the world. You can't, you can't just focus on beating the current price of oil or current price of gasoline. You have to think about what technologies can beat a price of gasoline of a dollar or a dollar fifty a gallon. Finally, I'll close by talking about the electricity industry. Demand is down there as well, although not as much as in uh, gasoline. Uh, we've seen the biggest drops in demand in some of the European countries that have been ravaged by the pandemic, particularly Spain and Italy, where we've seen 20% plus drops uh, in electricity demand. Uh, one side effect of that is that in California and Spain and a number of places that use a lot of renewables, the share of renewables has gone up. And that's because renewables, wind and solar, once they're built, are virtually free to run. And so they continue to run even when demand goes down. So this drop in demand has come primarily out of burning fossil fuels. So that's a bit of good news. Wholesale prices are down. Um, retail prices generally are not down yet. 
takes a while to pass that through through the regulatory process. Um, it does raise one challenge, which is that uh, we're starting to see as a result of this larger share of renewables, uh, greater challenges in balancing the grid. Wind and solar power are intermittent renewables. Uh, they can provide electricity quite cost effectively these days, but they, by themselves, they are not, uh, they, they can't alone balance the grid because you can't count on when they're going to be produced. You need storage or some other, or hydroelectricity or some other uh, uh, technology in order to keep the grid in balance. When you start seeing much higher share of renewables, that's a, that's a greater challenge for the grid operator. At the California Independent System Operator, which probably is the most experienced at this in the world, um, they've seen this, uh, it's well within their abilities right now. Uh, at some point in order to keep the grid balanced, they might have to actually start curtailing some of those renewables, those wind and solar plants in order to make sure that they have enough uh, other generation that they can control in order to keep the grid in balance. Uh, that's not a problem yet. Um, I actually, frankly, don't think it will be, but uh, in some other parts of the world, it could be a bigger challenge. So that's it. Thank you for joining me. Um, if you have questions, feel free to write to me. My email is there, severinbornstein at berkeley.edu. If you want to know more about me, there's my web page. A lot of this was drawn from some blogs I and others have written, uh, uh, most of which are at the Energy Institute blog. Um, I also do tweet on Twitter, mostly energy articles uh, from research and from the popular press. So feel free to follow me. And here's some further reading uh, that has played a role in the talk I have given today. Thanks for joining me. And I hope next year we will all be together in person uh, at the next Haas alumni reunion. Thanks a lot.